everyone. I'm Dave Gruber, Principal Analyst with the Enterprise Strategy Group, and I'm pleased to be here today with my colleague and original founder of the Cybersecurity Practice at the Enterprise Strategy Group, John Altsick. Hi, John. Hi, Dave. Nice to see you. Yeah, excellent. So, hey, we got together today a little impromptu, but we wanted to talk a bit about this ma massive CrowdStrike event and what's the implications of all of this on the broader industry. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the specifics and about the recovery process right now, and we're all in on working together to get to, to a full state of recovery. But the broader perspective is that there'll be a lot of long-term impact to what just happened in the industry. So we thought we would get together and we'd talk about some of the impact to the broader IT function and the broader cybersecurity function and talk about at least what our initial thoughts are on the kinds of things that we need to keep top of mind as we finish out the recovery process, but also as we prepare to respond, to remediate, and help ensure that these kinds of things uh, don't bite us in the future. So John, as, as a veteran of the industry, 20 uh, years following and tracking cybersecurity, all aspects of it, have you ever seen anything like this before? Dave, the one that comes to mind is uh, is an oldie but goodie, and this is the 1988, I believe it was, the Morris Worm. And if you aren't familiar with the Morris Worm, this was uh, an experiment done by a Cornell grad student on Unix systems at the time. And at the time, the internet was pretty much restricted to academic institutions, government institutions. But... Uh, by manipulating some packets and some code, this grad student basically took down the internet. And there were front page articles in the New York Times about this. There was a court case about this, uh, but it was disruptive, but it was a surprise. It was surprisingly disruptive because no one had really thought that this could happen and they hadn't done the kinds of uh, or put in, in place the kinds of controls to mitigate the risk. And uh, fast forward to last week, and this is what happened. I mean, it was just a monumental attack, uh, or a mo not even attack, a monumental disruption. Um, and and so, like I said, it harkens me back to the Morris Durham of yesterday. Yeah, for, for such a long time. You know, you know the... Uh... The industry is at a state of maturity where um, I believe that we assume when we uh, when we buy trusted cybersecurity solutions that they will uh, they will not impact our resilience. But at the end of the day, this is software, and um, and as we all well know, uh, no software is perfect. And in our race to uh, to improve the software and keep the software current and push. Uh, new capabilities out into the marketplace. We've seen lots of uh, lots of issues in software, but none that have had this sort of broad or far-reaching impact. So as an IT leader, it causes me to now have new questions. And, and it, it's not like I'm thinking about these things on my own. My executive team is already asking me to explain like what happened, why did this happen? What do we do to mitigate this sort of a thing from happening in the future? So there's lots of talk in the industry outside of the cybersecurity arena just more broadly about how did we get in this situation? And this didn't just impact our security software, um, it took down our entire operational environment. And so let's start out by saying like, where is this conversation or where do you believe, John, this conversation will go? Will this drill down on the cybersecurity industry and take a harder look at what do we need to do to verify and test cybersecurity solutions as we force them? Or, or will this raise up to a level above that that says, hey, this is a piece of third-party software that we uh, we trust to help us with with our uh, with our agenda. And like all pieces of third-party software, um, we need to think about risk mitigation strategies to ensure that uh, that we can stay resilient. Yeah, I, you know, one other thing comes to mind before I answer that question is that we have seen a similar event in the security industry with McAfee. Uh, with their dot dat files uh, that took down systems, it wasn't nearly as big, and you have to be our age, Dave, to remember it. But uh, but it did happen. It's kind of a similar type of thing. In terms of your question, though, I think um, we have to understand risks. We probably have to go broader on our risk assessment strategy and our risk management strategies because this came out of nowhere, 
And we hear a term a lot in our industry about cyber resiliency. And resiliency, I mean, you could take that up a level to IT resiliency because, um, and I, I, I actually uh, tweeted about this, is I talked to a chief risk officer a while back and they said to me, look, I don't care if it's a human error, if it's a natural disaster, if it's a cybersecurity incident, if it's an IT incident, my job is to assess that risk, uh, manage that risk, monitor that risk. And that's where we have to think about. You're right. This is software. So we have to uh, appreciate what the risk is and plan accordingly. Yeah. And so it's like, uh, maybe it begs the question, did we over-rotate a bit on cyber risk or cyber resiliency as we often talk about it today? Because there's so much risk from cyber threat, we've uh, become very focused on mitigating the cyber risk or, or cyber threat that's upon us. But on a broad basis, uh, for sure, this is a broader risk conversation, should be discussed as a broad uh, set of risk tolerance objectives and the uh, the policies, procedures that we put in place to ensure that we don't get caught in this, this place again need to be happening at that level, at the total operational level, likely driven from the very, very top of the organization. And the cyber team plays a role in this thing, but certainly not exclusive to the cyber team, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting because this is a SaaS application, so you trust a SaaS application. Uh, it's It's software as a service. So you assume it's a service. However, this service was touching the operating system kernel. So what I am hearing is you're right. We've over-rotated toward automation of uh, inc or automated patching or automated updates. Um, and I think what we'll see is some kind of sequencing here. So um, I'll set up a test bed. I'll have some virtual machines. I will look and make sure that the update um, keeps the update works as I suspect it will before I'm willing to update all my systems. I think we'll see at least that in the short term. Yeah, and 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 uh, certainly CrowdStrike uh, is not alone in in running software at the kernel level, be able to do the kinds of things we do and look out for the, the behavioral aspects of what's happening on the system. Many security companies uh, have similar approaches where they have agents that run on machines that actually run at the kernel level that have the potential to, to uh, disrupt in a similar fashion, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, to be clear, and I think Dave, you'll absolutely agree with this. We're big fans of CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike's an innovator. CrowdStrike is, um, is a very security conscious company. Uh, it's a good company. I think what happens though is that the crowd strikes of the world or software companies in general have to have it or anticipate some type of problem like this and at least provide for automated remediation because the, the killer here isn't just that it took down the systems. That's terrible. It caused a lot of disruption. However, if you have to physically go up to each machine to remediate it, that's a real problem when there are thousands and in this case, millions of systems. So I, I think we really need to think about, well, what's our plan? What's our fail-safe plan here? And, uh, and, and as a user, I would ask that question of all my software vendors. Yeah, and, and so, so I, this is the, the big question for me post this event is, where will we as an industry focus? Will we focus on, on this, on the, the basis of recoverability? And there's lots of talk around should we have diversity in our operating infrastructure where we're not all dependent on one particular operating system? And should should uh, a risk mitigation strategy be to diversify not only operating systems potentially, but also security software potentially? So there's lots of things that are going to be spawned out of this. Maybe there'll be a kernel level conversation that goes on and say agent versus agent lists and which one poses more risk in the infrastructure. We've seen that chat about that already. Uh, different technical uh, folks have been chatting about. Um, will there be a need for regulations that say, hey, when uh, when any software company reaches a certain point of impact to critical infrastructure, should there be some sort of an oversight or a certification or regulations that apply in this industry? So uh, it's, it's really interesting to see 
this type of event, you know, while zeroed in on CrowdStrike right now, the downstream impact of this could really focus on so many, uh, so many different things. And I and I wonder, as an industry analyst in the cybersecurity industry, about you know what's the sort of short, medium, and long term impact of cybersecurity, the industry in general. Other cybersecurity vendors are going to be asked to fulfill all these same requirements, right? That are coming to the table here. It's like your point, great company just have delivered just absolutely wonderful solutions for the industry and and played a really important role in securing the world. Um, they're just at the forefront of this, and this happened to happen to them. And it's not that it couldn't have happened to any other security company in the industry. But that said, this will have longer term impact. Uh, to the rest of the cybersecurity industry. And so uh, as IT buyers, um, when I'm looking at cybersecurity solutions, you know, you've already been at the table, right? W- when uh, the, the cybersecurity team has made purchase decisions for different cybersecurity software, but now maybe you'll spend uh, more time at the table assessing and evaluating new tools and technologies as they come in to your organization um, just to fulfill those needs in cybersecurity, maybe there'll be new regulations that uh, will spawn from this that may take place over the next 12 to 24 months in various um, geographies, right? There's lots of potential. So we got to keep our eyes on what's happening next, right? Yes. And, and you're, you, you're wise to point out that different geographies will react differently. There's a, a tolerance for regulations overseas uh, that Maybe there isn't here in the United States, especially in the in the current political climate. But I, to me, Dave, the kind of the thing is that cyber risk management or, or IT risk management is already wildly complex and gets more complex all the time with our attack surface growing. And this is yet another thing that we have to consider. So just like the software supply chain kind of came up and bit us in the behind with Log4j and with SolarWinds. Um, this is another consideration. And so it's really a business discussion with the CIO and the CISO. Um, but boy, I mean, this is just another thing that you really have to think about because we're everything's digital now, everything's software. So you have to accommodate for that risk. Right. So... Um... So as IT leaders, as cybersecurity leaders, once we're over the recovery process, I feel like we're still in the thick of, um, of ensuring that we're 100% uh, operational. And it may be weeks or months for some organizations who have less visibility into their operating environments uh, to fully, fully recover from this. The next thing that's going to be asked of IT and security leaders is what's the plan? Right? What's, what's the risk mitigation plan to take this forward? And and I know as an industry analyst, and I know you'll be doing the same, you know, we're going to be paying close attention to all the different initiatives and sharing that information with the rest of the industry so that people aren't building out all of this from scratch. I'm hoping that uh, that there's a tremendous amount of transparency as an industry here and in how we're thinking about mitigating this future risk. I'm sure there'll be lots of debate about where and what we should be focused on, and we'll bring out perspectives to the table uh, along with that. But I expect that there's a window of time here. There's like three months out. Uh, there may well be a board of director level review that says, okay, what are the initial stakes in the ground? What direction are we heading in here for a risk mitigation strategy? And so I, I strongly recommend that we put some stakes in the ground as far as timeframes for everybody. It says, focus on the first three months. What are we going to do to make sure that we are fully aware of, of our operation, maybe ask, our, you know, think about what what are the uh, policies that we need to have in place from all of our software vendors, right? Not just the cybersecurity industry, but you know, from all of our uh, software vendors, and and specifically uh, those that run as uh, as a service, right, as a cloud based deployment model versus those that run on on prem, and uh, think about what, what's that initial set of visibility and controls that we want to have in place, and then you know keep up with what's happening in the broader industry to think about that next six month window as, as far as, you know, what are the critical controls that we really want to put in place that help us more holistically uh, understand the potential risk. Cause that's a big piece of it for the large software inventories that we all end on and then assess that risk and then eventually mitigate that risk. That's probably 
12 to 24 month initiative uh, when you look out at what's involved, um, especially for some larger companies. Yeah, I, I'd say if there's a silver lining here, and it's hard to find one, but if there is one, it is that companies will put an incident response plan in place for the next time something like this happens. So I've heard of stories of uh, organizations that have remote systems with no one around for two hours to go and physically touch the system. We've seen the, the uh, pictures of um, technicians climbing ladders to get to um, uh, kiosks in airports and things. We didn't anticipate this. Now we should anticipate this and we should have an incident response plan. And as you, as you said, that incident response plan needs to be vetted. It needs to pre be presented to the business managers. It needs to be assessed for costs and effectiveness. And maybe we should red team this as well. But uh, lessons learned, you know, twice, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, uh, or fool me twice, shame on me. I guess it is. I got that wrong. But my point is... Um, Let's let's figure out what we do right next time because there will be a next time. Yeah, and maybe maybe I'll leave us on uh, on another really positive note, which is uh, pain spawns innovation, and I fully expect that from this event, there are many that are thinking about what kind of innovation can I put in place, whether it's software, hardware, uh, leveraging AI type capabilities or others that might allow us to get ahead of these types of problems and, and, and people chase these things with innovation. And so uh, stay tuned to some new ideas cropping up in the industry, be aware, and we'll do our best to cover all of those and put those out uh, in the industry so you see as they're happening what the potential is for those. And, and let's hope that the burden doesn't just completely fall upon me as an IT leader or me as a security leader but the burden falls on the industry at large, and we collectively put our heads together and come up with both a combination of innovation, controls, and visibility, um, and some new procedures, hopefully, and maybe some software uh, improvements, too, that that helps us mitigate this. Yeah, and one other thing I'd add, Dave, is what we saw that another good thing that we saw was the community at work together, other vendors stepping up people volunteering what they're doing for remediation. So uh, it does take a village, and we saw that. Yeah, and kudos to Crowd. Uh, you know, CrowdStrike's one of the premier incident response companies in the world. So this is not new territory from then, from a crisis response uh, viewpoint, which is why uh, George stepped up and was so transparent and open and honest about what's happening, because that's what we expect um, as, a, as a trusted provider for sure. So kudos to crowd strike and um but collectively as an industry you know i only see good things coming from this ad event going forward that will hopefully allow us to continue to scale and grow our structure through software hardware and all the other innovations so john thanks so much for joining for th me for this session stay tuned you know as we uh as this thing progresses uh, we will jump in and have some more thanks dave